Welcome everyone, my name's Hamish from HealthCert. And, uh, I've got the pleasure of hosting today's webinar. Today's webinar is on how to surgically manage lumps and bumps in general practice and we have Dr. Peter Rosberg. Peter is an experienced surgeon and educator based in Melbourne and the presenter of our primary care office procedures course. Um, you'll find in the GoToWebinar, you'll have a panel here. So Peter's going to do a presentation for around 30, 35 minutes and then we're going to do a QA. and uh, You'll find there's a questions panel uh, in your GoToWebinar panel. If during uh, Peter's presentation you have any questions, just feel free to type them in there. What we'll do is we'll all answer them all and we'll do a 10 or 15 minute Q&A at the end of the presentation. So if you type the questions in there as they come, in, come to mind, um, we will then answer them at the end. This webinar is being recorded, so if you do drop off or uh, if you want to refer back to it later, we will be sharing a copy with, with you and you're welcome to pass that on to any colleagues. Um, so with that, I think you should be able to see Peter on the screen. So uh, Peter's ready to go, so welcome Peter. Thank you, Hamish. Uh, hello, my name is Peter Grossberg. I'm a general surgeon practicing in Melbourne. And I'd like to talk to you today about how to safely remove lumps and bumps in general practice. Now with the age of uh, super specialization, it appears to me that the general practitioner has difficulty in deciding where to send and to whom they should send their patients who have lumps and bumps. These lumps and bumps need to be diagnosed and excised. And the query is, should I send it to a general surgeon? Should I send it to a plastic surgeon? Should I send it to an orthopedic surgeon or a hand surgeon? And the reply that you commonly get is, sorry, I don't do these type of procedures. I'm a specialist in shoulders only or arms only or abdomen only. So there are many of these lumps and bumps that you could safely do in a general practice, provided you have the diagnostic skills and the hand skills to remove these lesions. And they really don't need to be referred on. So you can see from this slide that Murray Brigel has been extensively involved in teaching over the years. And you can see from my uh, CV there that I'm still senior surgeon at one of the major hospitals in Melbourne. And I continue to teach both students and doctors as well as registrars. So the overall objectives of the course that HealthCert run, and we run this all over Australia, is to use your basic skills and your approach to extend the range of the procedures that you can safely do in the office. What are the objectives of this course? Well, it's to refresh your decision making, to develop your local anaesthetic technique. And it's not uncommon for us to hear from patients that the doctor put some local anaesthetic in, but it didn't work. And it's a matter of learning the correct technique for putting in local anaesthetic. We'd also like to improve, and we in fact are very successful in this, in improving the surgical skills, which include incisions, checking for hemostasis, learning to suture, and learning to close the wound in various different ways. We teach you to manage lacerations, removal of foreign bodies, sebaceous cysts and lipomas, which are the, probably the commonest lumps and bumps seen in general practice. Also, we teach you to learn how to drain abscesses, manage ingrown toenails and various other miscellaneous things. So why should you do it in your rooms? Why should you not send it to a super specialist? And the advantages are that there is no waiting time for the specialist to be available. You don't have to be told it's six weeks before he has a spot. It's done on the premises and it does not require specialists rooms which may be kilometres away and may, if you live in the country, uh, involve quite an extensive journey. It's cheaper for the patient as the fees in general practice generally are much cheaper and it maintains good relationships with the patients. So what's necessary to do these office procedures? Well, what's necessary is an ability to diagnose the problem. And this is done either with or without investigation such as an ultrasound. Very often 
We don't know what the lesion is, but it can be safely excised and sent for pathology. What else do you need? Well, you need the appropriate sterile equipment, which may or may not be disposable. Gowns and masks are not necessary. So what is necessary? Well, what's necessary is you need local anaesthetic with or without adrenaline. You need a reliable pathology service as virtually all lumps and bumps should be sent for histology, even if the diagnosis is fairly obvious, such as with a lipoma, as occasionally you can get something like a liposarcoma. You need a variety of suture materials. You need a couch or a reclining chair. I think it is bad medical practice to remove lesions in patients sitting in a chair, as when they faint, it's very hard to pick them up off the floor. Of course, you need a consent to do the procedure in the rooms. The consent is preferably written, but verbal is okay as long as it's documented. Remember, the most important thing is documentation. So what are the options when you do something in your rooms? There are two main options. You can have what's called a hyphricator, which is really a diathermy similar to what is used in all operating theatres, but it is such that you don't need a plate. And so it does not affect pacemakers. And it's very useful if someone is on anticoagulants, you do not need to stop the anticoagulants, you can just diathermy the bleeding vessels. And the second other option is of course an assistant who may be a colleague or a practice nurse. You can do lots of things on your own, but it's much more convenient if you have a colleague helping you. So who should do it? Well, you need to be aware of your diagnostic limitations and you need to be aware of your own surgical limitations. What we teach in the Health Cert course is we teach people to become confident in the use of instruments and confident in making diagnoses. One of the things that we teach, and we have several videos on this, is how to suture. It's surprising to me how many general practitioners have no idea on how to suture. And this of course is because they didn't have the opportunity when they were interns and residents in major teaching hospitals, as most of it was done by more senior personnel. So we teach the principles of halving. In other words, if you have a very long incision, you halve it and then you halve it again until you end up finishing the suture in a nice straight line. So what sorts of procedures are done in general practice? Well, there are sebaceous cysts, which are very, very common, particularly in the upper half of the body. There is the odd rare case of suppurative hydradenitis, which is really an infection of the apocrine glands, the sweat glands in the groin and in the armpits. We teach you how to drain abscesses. We teach you how to remove lipomas and any other subcutaneous lumps, such as a neurofibroma, such as a dermatofibroma. So there are various sites where these commonly are, and we teach you how to confidently remove them. So the topics that we cover is the clinical anatomy, the features that allows you to make the diagnosis. You of course must examine the patient. You don't necessarily have to do any investigations. And then of course you do the procedure and you must always talk about the complications to the patients. And fortunately complications from rooms procedures is very, very uncommon. So what you can see there on that slide is a small pilar cyst, which is a small lump in the scalp. And this is one of the things that is very commonly referred to us to be removed and can be simply removed by a competent, experienced and keen general practitioner. Sebaceous cysts are one of the commonest conditions that we see, and there are multiple methods in treating them. They can be either infected or non-infected. Sometimes they can be treated by drainage alone and frequently the patient will come in having had the abscess drained itself. 
but the underlying problem is still there. So these patients still need to be treated by surgical excision, and this is very, very simple. Okay, here's an example of a pilar cyst, or some people call them a sebaceous cyst of the scalp. And as you can see there, you can shave the hair, you can inject local anaesthetic around it, and you can remove it very, very simply. Occasionally, you might shave the hair or wet the hair to get the hair out of the way. You can mark the extent of the lesion. And the most important thing is being aware that particular areas of the body have a, a very rich blood supply and a rich nerve supply. And any lesions in the scalp bleed very easily as they have a very rich blood supply. When you're attending the course that we run, we'll go through the various equipments that you need. And I don't want to spend very much time on this at the present moment. This is a pilar cyst in the scrotal wall. This is not something that necessarily needs to go to see a specialist. It's simply a lump or a bump on the skin. And given that there's a lot of skin on the scrotum, this is a very simple thing to remove under local anaesthetic. Okay, interestingly enough, when we run this course and we ask who would be prepared to remove this type of cyst, very few people will put their hand up. But if you do the principles that we teach you, this is a very, very simple thing to remove. The dangerous thing is, of course, is it's on the face and this ends up being a cosmetic concern. But if you go through the type of instructions that we give you in doing it in normal skin lines, using normal local anaesthetic with adrenaline and having the confidence to remove it and suture it, you'll find that this is very simple. Now you can see on these slides here, the slide on the left top shows the patient lying down. It's been marked and it goes in the line of the eyebrow. You can see on the second slide there, local anaesthetic being in, injected into the area. The third slide, also local anaesthetic. And the fourth slide, the patient is ready to have this removed. This looks fairly daunting, but it is really a very, very simple procedure. So you can see on the slides here, one, two, three, and four, how this is just simply excised by an elliptical incision. It's removed, as you can see, on the top right slide. This is left with a small elliptical incision, which you probably wouldn't think twice about if you were doing it on the abdomen or on the leg. But in fact, it's exactly the same. And then on the second slide on the right, you can see it's been sutured up and then some steri strips applied. This whole procedure would probably take about 15 minutes. And once you get confident in using instruments, confident with your local anaesthetic, confident with the anatomy, you'll be able to do this fairly easily. You can see here, local anaesthetic infiltrated into the scrotum. And remember, this is done in the consulting rooms, in the general practices, practitioners rooms, or in my consulting rooms, under local anaesthetic. You do not need to go to theater it does not need to be a day case, and it is quite safe. One of the things that we must be aware of, of course, is what we call the outliers, things that you're not sure of. This picture here shows a bump on a leg. I would have thought that this was a sebaceous cyst, but what would have concerned me is that sebaceous cysts on the legs are not common. So already that allows us to start to think of some other important lesion that could be there. And in fact, a small punch biopsy was done on this lesion and it turned out to be an amelanotic melanoma. So even though we can do lots of things in our rooms, we've got to be a little bit careful on something that we think is probably not quite right. Subjurative hydradenitis 
This is, although an uncommon lesion, people who get infected sweat glands in the axilla or the groin can have this. And if you get recurrent abscesses in the area, rather than being an infected sebaceous cyst, it is more likely to be suppurative hidradenitis. One of the most important things is every lesion that is removed from the body should be sent for pathology. The second commonest problem that we see with lumps and bumps is a lipoma. And this is very simply removed under local anaesthetic. This is not something that needs to be sent to a plastic surgeon or even a general surgeon like myself. It can be very easily managed by the local doctor. The most important thing is to make the diagnosis. You should know that the lipoma moves under the skin. It's not attached to skin. It can be unilocular or multilocular. And very rarely is it attached to deeper structures. So this type of lesion on the elbow can be very easily removed by just infiltrating the local anaesthetic over the surface, which we'll show you. Here you can see we're checking to see if it moves from side to side. There it is being marked out and there is a, a longitudinal line in the middle of the elliptical incision because this doesn't have to be excised through an ellipse. This is just a straight line incision. You squeeze it and the lipoma pops out. You can see here the local anaesthetic. In this situation, I would use local anaesthetic with adrenaline. Then an incision is made directly over it. A lipoma has a very characteristic appearance. It is a bright yellow and it nearly always is well encapsulated, so it pops out in one piece. And that really gives you the diagnosis of a lipoma. Even though this may be very, very obvious, it is important to send it off to pathology. You can see there, just purely by squeezing, you don't actually have to dissect it out. You can remove this lipoma without any difficulty. It must be remembered also that lipomas, even though they're supposedly avascular, often have a feeding vessel that you can see actually in the base of that lipoma. So if you just pull it out, it will bleed. So the important thing is if you get it to the stage where you can see on that slide, you can either clamp the base of it or diathermy the base and it won't bleed. This is a large lipoma on the right shoulder. Once again, it has the characteristics of a lipoma and the chances are this is going to be a multi-lobulated lipoma. Now, you have to decide, would I do this in my rooms or is it too big? If you have some hesitation, then you shouldn't do it in your rooms. You should send it off to somebody where they can take it into an operating theatre and do it as a day case, even though it can be safely done under local anaesthetic. You can see here, this is actually done in the rooms, but we've got some drapes around it and we're injecting local anaesthetic into it. Occasionally, when you remove a sebaceous cyst, it can fragment. Now that doesn't matter, but the concern about fragmentation is if you leave a part of the cyst behind, you will get a recurrence. And it's not uncommon for patients to say, yes, my local doctor removed it two years ago, but it came back again. And the reason that it came back is that you've left behind the cyst wall. So when it fragments like this, it is important to look for the cyst lining in order to remove the lesion completely. That's all we have in terms of the photos and the slides. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you like. The most important thing really is confidence. And one of the things that we teach, and we do this over and over again in the course that we run for Health Cert, is that we 
teach you to learn how to hold the instruments, we teach you to remove the lesions and we teach you to suture. It's interesting on occasions when we talk to the GPs, we get interesting stories. I had one of the GPs that did our course. She was aged in her mid fifties and she'd been a GP for about 30 years and she had never removed a lesion and never sutured a patient ever in her general practice. She always referred them off to one of her colleagues who was interested in these procedures. After doing our course for two days, she was very excited and she said, the next person that comes in with a lump and a bump, I'm going to do. And hopefully what we do with this course is we teach confidence and we teach people to be sensible. So you should not attempt something that you're not comfortable removing. You've got to have an idea how to close the wound because it's not uncommon for us to get called to see somebody who's had a lesion removed but the local doctor can't close the wound because of too much tension. So hopefully in the courses that we run, you'll learn how to do these things, learn what to do and learn what not to do. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So if anyone's got uh, any questions, um, feel free just to type them into the questions box. You should find that panel inside your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, we still have about 10 minutes for, for Q&A. Um, and um, so feel free to, to enter them when we can uh, get Peter to, to answer. We do have one question. Peter, what's your advice on how to manage complications bleeding after surgery? Okay. I hate to say a cliche, but that's a very good question. Okay. Bleeding is a problem. One of the ways of getting out of bleeding problems is to have a hyphrocator, which is one of these diathermies. They are very, very safe to use. They do not cause any danger. They do not cause any burns. And I would always use a hyphrocator in my rooms. Having said that, most general practices probably don't have a hyphrocator. So the management of bleeding is the same principle as anywhere in theatre, out of theatre. The first thing you do is apply pressure. After applying pressure, you slowly remove the piece of gauze or the, the material that you're applying pressure with, see where it's coming from, put an artery force upon it and clamp it. You can sometimes just clamp it wait for five minutes and then take the clamp off and you'll find that the bleeding has stopped. If the bleeding doesn't stop, then you can what we call suture ligate. In other words, you can sew the bleeding vessels and tie them up. We teach the management of these bleeding things in the course that we run, but it's hard without having a specific case in front of you to know exactly how to manage it. It's not uncommon for wounds to ooze. That just means that there's lots of little micro vessels that are bleeding and the best treatment for that is pressure. And what I do is I just spray it with a bit of local anaesthetic with adrenaline and the adrenaline is very effective in stopping the bleeding. Excellent. Thanks, Peter. We've got a couple coming in. So um, if you can keep the answers relatively uh, short. short, just we'll get, try and get through them all. Um, how to prevent cyst ruptured while removing it? Any tips and tricks? Yeah, you've got to stay outside the cyst wall, but you don't want to worry too much about that. If the cyst ruptures, it doesn't really matter. So you just continue removing it. The most important thing is to remove the cyst wall. I tend to go a little bit wide when I'm removing lesions so that I don't get into the cyst. Excellent, thank you. Um, and it was a question relating to the course. Um, so you do, we do, you do teach suturing in the course. So it's the removal of the lump and the suturing after, isn't it, in yeah. the primary care? We, do. we make a big deal out of suturing, and we teach simple over and over sutures. We teach mattress sutures. We teach subcuticular sutures, and you get lots and lots of suturing and doing knots. And we find that at the end of the two-day course, people are very, very confident in suturing. Thank you. Um, any method to ensure the walls of the cyst are removed in toto to prevent recurrence? 
Uh, the, no, there's no specific method. Generally, you can see the cyst wall. Now, if you've removed three quarters of the cyst wall and you leave a little bit of the cyst wall behind, you won't get a recurrence because the cyst wall obviously relies on being a complete circle. So if you leave a, a little bit of cyst wall behind, it doesn't matter. Excellent, thank you. Um, when would you give oral antibiotics for post-op wound infection? Okay, generally when I'm doing a lump or a bump in the rooms, I do not give antibiotics at all. I think we overuse antibiotics. So as a rule, most skin lesions are clean. If there is an infected wound, then that's different. If you have an infected sebaceous cyst, I would give antibiotics for 24, 48 hours. I would not give a five day course, but 24, 48 hours, and that's usually sufficient. And the antibiotics that I would use is something that covers staph, because almost every wound will have staph in it. Excellent, thank you. Um, all right, and it's coming towards the end of our questions. Um, any advice on how to minimise scarring during procedures on the face? Okay, uh, once again, <laughs> an excellent question. The answer is there are no ways to minimise scarring. The most important thing is make sure you bring your wound edges together. And that's one of the keys to the suturing. We make a big deal about suturing. You have to evert the wound in order to get a straight line. If you bring the wound together in a straight line, um, the wound will often become, uh, uh, have a little groove in it. So the important thing is to evert the edges. The other important thing is to try not to cross um, lines. The other important thing is that you have to warn the patients. There are certain body habitus that will make keloid and there is nothing that you can do that will prevent it. Interestingly enough, the face generally heals very, very well. And so it's rare to get uh, an ugly scar on the face or a widened scar. The widened scars are nearly always secondary to infection. Excellent, all right, we do have Quick, a couple quick ones here. Um, yep. Any preference in use of suture, chromic or plain gut for first layer? Uh, I, in, in my rooms, it's, it's interesting, but Maury and I differ on this, but in my rooms, I don't use any cat gut or plain cat gut or chromic cat gut because mm -hmm. I don't believe my rooms are not sterile and I don't like to put things in that are going to stay permanently inside. So as a rule, I don't use it, but if I did use it, I would use chromic cat gut. Thank you. Uh, and our last one for our 30 minute webinar, what strength of LA and adrenaline to anaesthetize the area? Okay, that's terrific. Removal of a lump. I, I was okay, I only have two types of local anaesthetic in my rooms. That way I can never make a mistake. I have 1% xylocaine with adrenaline and I have 1% xylocaine plain. And they're the only two local anaesthetics that I have in my rooms. The local anaesthetic with adrenaline has to be one in 80,000 or one in 100,000 because anything stronger than that can obviously have cardiac effects. So 1% xylocaine will do you for every case. You would rarely use more than 20 mil of xylocaine 1% and that's a very, very safe dose. Excellent, thank you. All right, well that concludes uh, the webinar today. Thank you everyone for attending. As I mentioned, um, we will be sending out a recording of this webinar to everyone attended. Please feel free to pass it on to a colleague. Uh, we are running the primary care office procedures uh, certificate course in Melbourne coming up in February next year will be the next uh, opportunity to, uh, to look at the program and to, uh, to learn those skills. Uh, if you do have any questions about the content or in fact any questions about the content that was covered today in the webinar, please feel free to uh, email uh, courses at healthcert.com and we can pass on the question to Peter and get it answered for you. So Peter, thank you for your time today.
and That's we okay, look forward to see you in uh, in February in Melbourne. Yes, we'll see you in February, and we hope to see a lot of the people that are watching the webinar. Thank you very much. Okay, bye.